bit about this ahead of a time before the quiz on section three. So who's the highest member of the caste system? Raise your hand if you know. Okay, good, Jaden. Who is it? Is it the Yes, but do you remember the title? Yes. Brahmin with an I. Brahmin. B-R-A-H-M-I-N. What is, raise your hand if you know what Brahmin with an A is. Yes. The universe. The, yeah. And you weren't even here. Good for you. Okay, so Brahmin with an A is the universe. Brahmin with an I is the highest member of the caste system. Raise your hand if you know what the lowest member of the caste system is called. Everyone should have their hand up. The lowest one? What is it? The untouchables. The untouchables. How would you like that? Okay, so their caste determines a lot of things about how they can live and what they can do. Um, tell me some of those, Neil. What are some of the things that are determined by them being in the caste system? It determine. Well, I'll give you just one, and then you tell me some more. It determines how they dress. What else? Um, how they, where they work. Where they work. And what, they what they eat. Good. Any others? Respect. Who they marry? They have to marry in the caste system. Okay. What did you say? The respect they receive. Yeah, the respect they receive is definitely part of it. Um, and high caste people try not to touch anybody from the lower ca caste or be around them or be polluted by them. Okay. There were some a few good effects from this caste system, even though it's a cruel system. Everybody believed, even the untouchables, that they were there because of what they'd done in their last life. So if you were an untouchable, you would have thought, I must have been a really bad person in my last life. Or maybe I was a bug and I was really good, so I got to be a human, you know. Yes, did you have something to say? Oh, you were saying like, how they had some good things. I was going to say. Yes, that. what are they? Uh, they had people with like diverse customs, like they were able to live together. Yes, it made order in the society. That's a good point. They could live together. Everybody knew their job. In a way, there's some security in a stable order like that. Anything else that anyone can think of that are the effects? Rachel? Um, it gave the people a sense of like, independence. And yes. They, within their own caste, they were free. They just had to stay in their little uh, system there. All right. Um, did I miss anything? on that. All right, family life. We have the joint family. Did we talk about this already? Maybe I, just because I've done it so many times. Okay, the ideal family was the joint family. What does that mean when it's a joint family? Who can tell me? Raise your hand if you know the answer. Okay, everyone whose hand up can tell me and the rest of you can't. What is it? It's like where um, like the whole family should have come dwelling. Okay, so that means from the newest great-grandbaby to the oldest great-grandmother are in one dwelling. Uh, what would be good about that? What do you think would be good about that? The mother would have lots of help. Yeah, that's for sure. That's good. Is that what you were going to say? Um, I think one of the good things about it is you wouldn't be so narrow-minded in your understanding of different ages because you would see everyone from a baby to an old person. Remember I was talking to you about how um, in our culture young people treat old people a lot of times like they don't exist unless they're related to them. You know, they just kind of look right through them. Um, you would be taught respect for the elders, but you would understand every age. And a grandma who can hardly do anything else can still maybe help hold the baby or sew something. So everybody can do something to make the family work and you have an appreciation of all age levels. Um, but the hard part is you have a lot more chance for disagreement and argument. And that's why there has to be some sort of hierarchy in the system of who calls the shots. Does it tell you who does that in this joint family? Right, the father. There has to be, because think of that many people living in one house. There's going to be disagreements, right? You have to have a judge, and he's the judge and jury. He decides, he stops it, and you've got to obey. Okay, children and parents. How did parents and children relate? Children were taught to respect their parents from an early age? Yes, they were taught to respect their parents. And as soon as they were old enough, the children worked right alongside the adults. Did you have something to add to that? Well, like it said, like, the, when girls are little, they were, like, taught how to become, like, wives. 
Yes, they started wife training when they were little. And unfortunately, wife training says it was to serve and obey your husband, which isn't bad if you have a good husband, but I don't know about if you don't. Um, what was one of the most important duties of the parents? To arrange, like, a good marriage. To arrange a marriage. Now, I was talking to someone who had an arranged marriage once, and I said, oh, that's so horrible. I would, I would hate it. And she goes, why? I think it's, the, she, she was young. I mean, she was, like, in her 20s, and she had had her parents pick her husband. She says, here, you leave it up to the kids, and they're too dumb to know who to pick anyway, and half the marriages in this country end up in divorce. She says, my parents know me well, my husband's parents know him well. They get together and they meet us and they decide whether we would make a good match. And she said, and I was perfectly fine with that because would I choose any better if I just choosed on, chose on a romantic attraction? I don't think so, you know. And so she was really comfortable with the arranged marriage thing because she thought nobody knows me better than my parents and they know what I need and what kind of personality would, would work with mine. Well, if all the parents were as conscientious and careful as hers, and she said, besides, if in arranged marriages, if you really resist and say, I just can't marry this person, the parents, most of the time, they will go along with that. So I thought that was interesting to hear a young person defend arranged marriages, because our attitude when we hear arranged marriage, what do we all say? Oh. oh, yuck, that's awful, right? We say that, but she thought it was a great idea. At best, though, in this culture, it wouldn't be a mistake to get your parents' approval on who you choose to marry. If they have a real serious objection, you probably should consider that as a red flag because they know what things count over the long haul. Things that you think, oh, it won't matter once we're married. They know what matters and they know what doesn't. So it's really a good idea to at least seek your parents' approval on who you choose and get their advice because there's wisdom and good counsel. Okay, women's lives, like I said, in the Aryan time, they had more rights, but those got away, got lowered. Okay, let's look at four, because I don't think we've talked about this, and this is so interesting. All right, chapter four is on three philosophies in China. The first one is Confucianism, and then they do legalism and Taoism. Now, let's talk about Confucianism first. Confucius based his philosophy on relationships and there were five significant relationships. If I gave you four of them on a quiz you should be able to tell me which one's missing. So let's hear what's the first relationship? Um, older brother to younger brother. Father to son. Husband to wife. Husband to wife. Friend to friend. Friend to friend and? Eldest. She said eldest brother but there's five so we're missing one. Ruler to subject. Yeah. Ruler to subject is the one we missed. Okay, I wasn't even sure myself which one we missed. So ruler to subject, these relationships. Now, Confucius was on to a great idea here because the basic unit of society is the family. A healthy society has to have healthy families. When you have a large number of dysfunctional families in your culture, it affects the whole community. So he was saying we start with getting these key relationships in order. Now that's pretty logical, don't you think? I mean, if we can have our families healthy. Now, when we talk about these relationships, he names first the person who has the most authority in the relationship. For example, elder brother to younger brother. If you're a younger brother, you won't like this, but if your older brother, you guys are in a, a, a disagreement, he's going to win because he has the authority. Um, he's going to get to do it the way he wants, and you're going to have to go along with it because he's the authority. Now, why is this so smart? Um, because, let me, let me apply it to a marriage because I've had 40 plus years experience with a marriage. So, um, when a husband and wife disagree on something, they absolutely cannot come to terms, which in my marriage has only happened once or twice where we couldn't at least come to a compromise. But if you get a deadlock, where you absolutely can't agree, someone has to be pre-assigned to make the final decision. Otherwise, you could argue about it for eternity and never get the job done. So when you are locked 100% I want it this way, 100% I want it this way, someone has to be pre-decided to call the final shot so that the family can continue to function without arguing. Now, 
you know, there's a thing in the Bible that says, wives obey your husbands. And I know a lot of women get really bent about that. My husband usually says to me, I say, well, you're the husband, you know, kind of teasing him like, I'm here to obey. I'll tell him and he'll laugh and he'll say, well, my decision is to have you make the decision. Oh, that's what he'll right. tell me. So, but usually anything we disagree on, compromise is a good thing. But if there have been a couple cases where we've just come like this, I have said to him, okay, you're going to make the decision. And he doesn't like that because that's a lot of responsibility. What if he decides wrongly? I mean, it's real nice to be the one that doesn't make the final decision because if you make it and you're wrong, you're kind of like, oh, I should have done it the other way. So, you know, that's not a fun position to be in either. But in this society, there was always someone to call the final shot in any kind of head-on action. That guy had love pressure on him always. <laughs> yeah. And ruler to subject, who, do you, who obeys? Who? Subject to obey ruler. Right. So these, these were how he did it. And he also believed in advancement by merit, which was really nice because unlike India where you're stuck in the caste system and you can't get a job outside of, if you're an untouchable, the only job you can do is handle garbage or dead bodies or sewage or something. You can't promote yourself. But with Confucius, you could. How did that, hap how did that happen? You guys read about it. How did you, how were you able to promote yourself in jobs? If you were um, following Confucianism, did it tell you in here? I think it did. Well, I'll tell you. I don't see it. Anyway, you could take civil service exams. You could study really hard and you could get higher positions. So unlike some cultures where you can't have, in India, you could only have jobs in your caste, or in early um, England, you could only have jobs um, if someone chose you. It didn't matter how good you were. If you were royalty, you could be a general in the army. But if you weren't, you'd probably never make it. So there was all that kind of thing. Or think about kings when they have uh, inherited rulers. You know, so I'm the king, and my son is the next one to be king, and he's an idiot. You know, maybe he's even retarded, but he's the next king. That doesn't really make sense, and it has happened. So, um, you know, my son's an idiot, and he's supposed to be king next. I'm a little concerned about that. But in Confucius' system, you have to earn the right to have your position. And that was really a great idea, because in that time period in history, it didn't happen very often. Now let's look at legalism. Uh, legalism grew out of the teaching, teaching, pff, teachings of Han Feitzi. Han Feitzi taught that people needed strict punishment to obey. That was his number one thing. Now to remember how to spell it and to remember what it's about, I always call him uh, Han Feitzi. And I say, if you're bad, he cuts off your hands and feetsies, because that's what they did. If you stole something, your hand was cut off. If you, the punishment was really what we call legalism. There was no exception. If you did this thing, what if I picked an apple up out of the middle of the road and no one was around to claim it, but then somebody came running back and said, they stole my apple because it had fallen off their truck. I'd get my hand cut off. I couldn't say, wait, I had no excuses. I couldn't say, but, but it was all by itself. I just picked it. Nothing. Legalism is you disobey, you have the punishment, end of subject. Boy, just never pick up anything. You That's right. Down my saying, don't touch a thing. That's right. And you know, it's really interesting interesting because w his idea was the people should be afraid of punishment. They should always be afraid and worried about punishment and then they'll behave themselves. So in other words, he really, to ha have a legalistic policy, you have to see no basic good in people, right? And there's not um, circumstantial, what, no, what's the word I'm going for? There's not um, reprieve because of the, of the circumstances. They don't care about the circumstances. In legalism, it's black and white. You did it, you're punished, period. So remember Han Feitzi, who's that's not really how you say his name, it's more like, like Han, Han Feitzi. Han Feitzi. So um, remember him as Han Feitzi because he cuts off your hands and feetsies, and that's legalism. Okay, Taoism is great. I look at Taoism as the earliest hippie movement. And you guys know about the hippies, right? I mean, that's the era I went to college in the hippie era. So that was, I wore the bell bottoms and had the flower things or the Indian bands or the fringed leather purse or whatever we were doing back then. 
it was the hippie era. And so the hippies are kind of like, in a way they're anarchists. They don't want the government to interfere or bother them in any way. They just want peace and do their own thing. And they're like, hey man, peace, right? That's a hippie. He comes, his, his hair's hanging down, he's got a band around his head and his beat up jeans with bell bottoms and this big white belt and he goes, peace man, right? Woo. Well, this is the Taoists. The Taoists, they're really interesting. Tao means unspoken way. And people who followed Taoism were seeking the way. Well, what's the way? Well, it's the way, man. You know, the way. Hey, find the way. They don't tell you what the way is, but that's what they're seeking. Okay, it could be a lot of things. You can put that on yourself. Maybe they'd explain it to me if they were here. But um, it was just seeking the way. And the way was, there was a book called The Way of Virtue. So they were trying to seek something that was right. Um, the interesting thing is that these people believed in, I hope this is in here. I might just tell you anyway. They, um, they liked alchemy. What's alchemy? Anybody know? It used to be really, really popular in this time period. Yes. Yes, and what they were trying to make was gold. Alchemy was trying to turn base metals into gold, and people believed it could be done, and they were always trying it. Well, the Taoists messed with this, you know. They wanted to be in nature, and they were all laid back, but if they could figure out how to make gold, then they could pay for their, you know, their food or whatever, but they were always doing this. And they accidentally invented gunpowder when they were trying to do this. They invented gunpowder, figured out what it did. So you need to remember, they invented gun, just remember, the Dow invented the pow, okay? Gunpowder goes pow, so the Dow invented the pow, oh, and it was an accident. But boy, has that made a huge difference in a lot of things, that invention. Does it not tell in here that they invented gunpowder? I'm disappointed. Okay, guess not. Okay, so that's the Tao, and you need to know they invented gunpowder. So here's what it says. Taoists rejected conflict and strife. They wanted to end conflict between human desires and simple ways of nature. They stressed the virtue of yielding. Water, they pointed out, always flows downhill. It doesn't resist. Man needs to go with the flow, man. I mean, that sounds so hippie, right? The, the hippies probably learned their movement from the Dows, I don't know, but they really sound like a bunch of um, hippies. So, thank you. All right, so then the, um, the last thing, there is an article here on legalism, I hope you read it, it was on page 91, and then they talk about how Buddhism moved to China. It was 100 AD when um, Buddhist missionaries went to China and Buddhism did catch on in China. Um, so it, it migrated to China around a hundred. At first the Chinese had trouble with the new faith. Um, like the Chinese tradition valued family loyalty while Buddhism honored monks and nuns who gave up the benefits of family for solitary meditation. Despite obstacles such as this, Buddhism became popular especially in times of crisis. Um, it has great appeal because it promises escape from suffering. Now, remember I told you there were two kinds of Buddhism, the original more strict kind called what? Begins with TH, what is it? Theraveda. Theraveda. And the more gentle one is called? Mahayana. It was the Ma Mahayana version of Buddhism that became popular in China. So that, just to let you know that Buddhism is now moving to China. Okay, so we're going to take a quiz on this, but let me ask you some questions first. Um, who believed that um, an older brother should be subject to, I mean a younger brother should be subject to his older, Confucianism. that was Confucianism. If I told you this person was working hard to get a new position in studying, to get a new position in government, what philosophy am I talking about? Confucianism again. Um, who invented gunpowder? Okay. Um, what did the Tao especially like? They said they saw their examples of how to live in what? 
In nature, that's good. All right, and they're seeking, the Tao are seeking what? The way. The way, man, okay, we're gonna find the way. And what is legalism? Oh, yep, strict punishment. Cut your hand off, yeah. Cut your hand off because you stole that. All right, you ran away from your master, cut your feet off, all right? It's strict, it's very, very strict. Uh, so let's try this quiz and see what we can do. All right, in our last um, lecture, we talked about the three philosophies of ancient China that were the most popular. The first one was what? Confucianism. Let me hear you. The second one was legalism, and the third one was Taoism. Taoism was started by Lao Tzu. He was considered the master, and um, it meant... I think it meant master, his name, I'm not sure, but the, he started that. And the Tao was, like I said, very similar to the hippie movement in a lot of ways. The Tao had the pow, man. Okay, to, now we're going to talk about some of the strong rulers of China. And one of the strongest ones was Shi Huangdi. And he, he was, originally, he was called Zheng. Um, who can read Setting the Scene for me? What? Setting the scene on page 93. Okay, Maddie. From his base in western China, the powerful ruler of the state of... How do you say that? Just say one or something. Rose to unify all of China. An ancient Chinese poet and historian described how Zhang crushed all his rivals. Cracking his long whip, he drove the universe before him, swallowing up the eastern and western Zhao and overthrowing the feudal lords. In 22, or 221 BC, Zhang proclaimed himself Shi Huangzi, or first emperor. Though his methods were brutal, he ushered in China's classical age. Historians call it a classical civilization because it set patterns in government, philosophy, religion, science, and the arts that served as the framework for later culture. Right, so he started a classic, the classic civilization, and the things that were born during this civilization still influence China today. Now this guy was amazing. I try to think of, here's this guy, he's in this uh, little state, um, his name is Zheng, but he was fierce. He had to be very strong and fierce. It talks about him driving the universe before him with his whip, and we're going to find out that he was a legalist, and that also takes a very harsh, strong personality. So when we talk about Shi Huangdi, we're talking about someone who's very, very, I love how my Chinese um, students always laugh when I say a Chinese word. I don't speak Chinese. You want to say it for me? Shi Huangdi. Shi? Shi Huangdi. Shi Huangdi. Oh my goodness. And here they say in the book to say S-H-E-E, -E, which is Shi. So it's Shi Huangdi. And is that better? Shi Huangdi, a little better? Okay. So Shi Huangdi was, which means first ruler. So he, um, he was a strong personality, and it, the Warring States were in power then. This was a period of the Warring States. Remember we'd had those earlier dynasties like the Zhou that we studied, he overthrew that. He wanted to unify the Warring States. How long do you think it took him? 20 years. 20 years to do this job of just, so 20 years of his rule was just unifying the country. But once he did it, he ran his country in a legalistic way, harsh punishments. He was also one of those rulers that hated everybody who disagreed with him. You guys know anybody like that today? Just hates everybody who disagrees with him. But he, doesn't, he didn't just say nasty tweets about him the next day. He had them killed. So he was very harsh against any dissidents. Anybody who didn't agree with him or support him, um, he would take really, uh, he would jail them, torture them, or kill them. Well, I would just pretend to do a plea on, on everything. Yeah, so that's, that's right. I would too. So he, he uh, did you want to say something, Sean? Do it 
Right, this is when he was finally the ruler. He took a legalistic stance. All right, so Shu Huangdi abolished feudalism in China because in feudalism, you know, you have like a lord of a manor and he has all these people that work for him on his, uh, in his area and he protects them in danger, but they had a feudal system like that. But Shu Huangdi wanted these people to be loyal to him. So he abolished the feudal system and he replaced it with uh, districts um, that were, let's see, I think it tells us how many, 36 military districts. So he ruled each district with military power. The most famous accomplishment of this ruler was the Great Wall of China. And if you look on page 94 in your book, you'll see how huge that was. It's in red. And it'd be a nice thing for your bucket list to say, I'm going to walk along the Great Wall of China. Uh, but they, many parts of it still stand. And when you see how beautifully it was built, it's quite impressive. He also built roads and canals. This would help unify. He did something else to unify all these warring states into one congruent thing. He, un he um, regulated the weights and measures. He made everybody's money the same. Can you see how much confusion that would get rid of? Because each little state had their own money and their own weights and measurements. He unified that and he, um, and he had coins for the money. So he, oh, and he, unif he unified the writing. The writing was taught the same all over. So this was really an amazing person. Now his dynasty, but when he died in 210 BC, um, the people sort of started to revolt and the thing started to fall apart. And that's when we have, um, oh boy, I'll say this one wrong. Okay, we have Liu Bang, an illiterate peasant, defeated rival armies and founded a new Han dynasty. So we have, after Shi Huangdi, we have Liu Bang. the Han. Liu Bang. Liu Bang. Liu Bang. I'll never say it that way. <laughs> okay, so he founded the new Han Dynasty, and you're going to read about the Han Dynasty in this, and it's going to mention how he did this, um, and then you're going to learn about the most famous ruler of the Han Dynasty, who was Wu Di, and he was a Han emperor who did a lot of things. He adopted Confucianism, which was easier for the people than legalism. But he also built canals and roads and granaries and um, started the country in a good trade program. The sale of iron and salt gave him money to run his government and he expanded China. And the most important thing he did for trade was to build the Silk Road. How many of you have ever heard of the famous Silk Road in Europe? the Silk Road. Um, do you know how long that road was? It, it was 4,000 miles long. 4,000 miles and it linked China to the Fertile Crescent. And the Fertile Crescent was a great trading area. You know, they had all kinds of things there. So the traders would go on this Silk Road. Now, the Silk Road was great. It opened up trade, but it had some problems. And one of the problems was um, that it was real easy for robbers to hide along the road. So it was a very dangerous road to travel. And that would be a problem that would be overcome when we finally were able to get ships out and going around these areas. But for now, they had only the Silk Road. Here it tells you about scholar officials. Now remember, the Han Dynasty is under Confucianism, so this is talking about Confucianism. Uh, it relied on well-educated scholars to run the bureaucratic government, and the Confucius, uh, Confucian idea of a gentleman prevailed. So here's some more information for you on Confucianism. This is on page 95. Are you on page 95? This is at 95 at the bottom. It says, a gentleman would be courteous, dignified, and possess a thorough knowledge of history, music, poetry, and Confucian teachings. I wish our leaders would follow that today. Courteous, dignified, and educated. That would be nice. Um, civil service exam. Han emperors adopted the idea that government officials should win their position by merit. And the other thing you're going to read about is some of their accomplishments and some of the things that were going on in that time, like acupuncture. And you're going to read a little sidebar on page 96 that tells how acupuncture works. Have any of you ever had acupuncture? My mom's going to have acupuncture. 
Yeah, my physician at Kaiser just um, recommended acupuncture for a consistent problem I'm having with my back. So I will be experiencing it for the first time. We'll see how that goes. So anyway, we still do acupuncture today. All right, um, the civil service system had an enormous impact on China for almost 2,000 years. That's pretty strong. All right, that's all I'm going to share with you today. I want you to read the rest and learn it. I want you to know what the achievements of the Han Dynasty were, and that's the last section of this section. All right, so you have a quiz on that early in the class tomorrow.